Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Really excited to be here. OK, cool. Clicker works. Um, again, uh, welcome to Secret Product TBA Mapbox Vision SDK. That actually works really well with meter and rhyme, which is awesome. Uh, again, I'm Tori. I am leading product strategy for autonomous vehicles at Mapbox. Uh, I have the pleasure today to talk about this really exciting product that we just announced yesterday. Uh, already got a lot of great feedback. We were having incredible conversations right next door, and I'm looking forward to having some right after this as well. Uh, I get to talk about this, but I want to first give a quick shout out to six of the engineers that worked on this project who are all sitting over here uh, on your left. Uh, Alexander, 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 Dennis, Dennis, and Victor. Um, and we will all be next to the car right after this to like really start messing around the technology and trying to break it and show you like how real it is and how exciting this is for Mapbox and our developer community. So quick outline. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, just give us some perspective about automotive computing and navigation, a, a very brief history, talking about first computing in the car for the first time and then navigation experience in the car for the first time, bringing us where we are today. Uh, and then sort of a little more context instead of temporally, just uh, conceptually about how distributed sensors are so powerful and then how we're going to be adding visual context to location with this uh, SDK. Uh, and then I'll dive a little bit into how it actually works, what platforms we're supporting today, and what you can actually do with it as a developer. And then for the Q&A, we're actually going to be very hands-on and much more experiential rather than question and answer. So. Uh, Let's put this all in perspective, and before we talk about the future, talk a little bit about 50 years ago. So the tagline should tell you everything you need to know here. Uh, this is the first time we ever put a computer into a car, was in 1968, exactly 50 years ago, and the tagline was, it's smarter than a carburetor. Uh, that just gives you some idea of what, what cars were like 50 years ago, and the fact that they don't call this a computer, because no one really knew what a computer was, I guess. They called it an electronic brain which today would sound like a buzzword, but I think back then they really wanted people to think it's like a brain, but it's electronic, because we've, we've come a really long way from here. If you fast forward 13 years, they actually called this thing the electro-gyrocator. Uh, this is the first truly automotive navigation system. Uh, it's not actually using satellites. It's using a very early version of an IMU or inertial measurement unit, so using dead reckoning and a, a helium gas based instrument that was also used by Cold War pilots to do dead reckoning, basically figuring out where you are by where you started from and how you've accelerated and decelerated and turned in that time. The first time we actually put GPS with visualization into a car was in a vehicle called the Mazda Cosmo in 1990. And it definitely looks like the first time you put GPS into a car as well. Um, for those of you, I don't know, are there any sys admins here? Um, I will ask you to, to avert your eyes, because uh, I'm sure many people here are familiar with, uh, with cable porn, like uh, very nice looking cable management. These next few slides are going to be like uh, a Saw movie version of that, as we start to talk about what the trunks of autonomous vehicles looked like when we first started putting like, really high performance computing in cars. So, uh, I know this might look kind of gross, but this is the vehicle that won the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2005 from Stanford and effectively kicked off Google's self-driving car program. So this is actually six 1.6 gigahertz uh, Google M, or sorry, not Google M, excuse me, um, Intel Pentium M processors and all these different computing units and then all the wires um, from the... From the projects I've worked on in autonomous vehicles, you're usually tinkering and tinkering and tinkering until it works, and then you just stop, and then a little bit later you might, might add one thing on, and there's not really time for the, the very analog refactoring that goes into actually optimizing cable management. And this did not get much better uh, in my first experience doing this in 2013. Uh, so this was actually a project I was working on where we were doing what's called a MOART, uh, which is an automotive industry acronym that stands for Mother of All Road Trips. Uh, we drove around and did mapping and tested ADOS features in automated vehicles in Chicago, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Uh, and this is actually a Mobileye uh, dev kit hooked up to a bunch of other equipment. Um, you can see this whole mess of, of Ethernet, USB, power, CAN, LIN, FlexRay, uh, and this whole rat's nest actually did some really cool things. Uh, but you can see it's not a very elegant system. This brings us to today where we have something that is actually quite elegant. And I think every single person in this room probably has something in your pocket that can run it right now. 
So that's really exciting. So that's sort of giving a quick history to how this has gotten cleaned up a lot. And there's a lot of incredible software that you can either run in the car natively on something like a Tegra or uh, on your phone or any, really any connected camera. Uh, but now I want to talk a little bit about why having a distributed sensor network is really powerful. So here's a probe point. With a probe point, we already get some pretty interesting information. Uh, anyone who's sharing this, we get anonymized trace ID. We get the timestamp. We get the latitude, longitude, and elevation. It's basically time, x, y, and z, and then just some way to identify that. So if we get a whole bunch of these over a period of time. We can make some. We have some way of reconciling how an object or person holding a phone or a vehicle or an asset is traveling. Uh, just with that one piece of information, even if it's only one pro point, we can already do a lot of really cool things. We can tell you where you are and some other interesting or points of interest that might be around you. Uh, but we can also tell you how to get to where you're going. And then you can imagine, once you collect more and more of this information, we can start to build a map of how the world is moving. And this gets really exciting because uh, according to digital trends, we're going to have about 6 billion smartphones in use by 2020. Uh, smartphones is the, covers the entire gamut of any phone that would qualify, uh, but we can tell you that today there are over a billion devices that will run the Vision SDK. The reason this is exciting is what happens when we really multiply those pro points by a lot, and this is still just talking about X, Y, and Z, no, no imagery. You can start to construct pictures. I think Young actually touched on this in his keynote earlier, but you can actually make out where the HOV lanes are. You can make out that this is a frontage road, and every once in a while someone stops uh, in the shoulder, and you can see sometimes people actually drive really fast in the shoulder. I don't know who that is, but that's like super legal. Um, and then I think Young also showed this. Uh, what we can do over time with, with thousands or tens of thousands of points is actually not only tell how fast people are driving, but where they're making lane changes and how these roads are used. So now finally getting to the Vision SDK, what happens when we add visual context to location? Basically, we go from this to this. And I'm showing just a single frame here rather than showing videos, because the amount of information you can extract from a single frame of imagery is incredible. And we can do that without having to send any of that off your phone. Like, for example, in one of these pictures, it's very helpful to know there's a crosswalk in this place. If you're looking for a parking space, you can imagine how you could find a way to notice and then indicate where open parking spaces are. You can notice if a lane is closed, instead of having to wait for like 20 people that have to slow down to like next to zero speed, you actually can just tell from one or two frames that a lane is closed or that there's an emergency vehicle or that there's construction. So being able to do this historically was, was quite difficult because you had to have a lot of computing power at the edge in order to be able to do this. So we returned to this really ugly computer in the back. Uh, the alternative was blowing up your data plan by having to upload all of that to the cloud and paying a lot of money for storage and processing. Uh, so we decided to move to the phone. Uh, initially, uh, this was very computationally expensive. And instead of blowing up your phone bill, we actually just melted your phone down, essentially, uh, with the amount of compute that was necessary. Like when we first started, uh, when the Mint's team first started working on this, it would actually drain the battery of the phone while the phone was plugged in. Uh, and today, you can see that we are running those phones Today, you can see that we are running those phones. Uh, I think yesterday, we were running them for 14 hours straight. And not only did it, was a phone fine, it, it wasn't even that hot of the touch. And you'll be able to see today what it feels like after running for about six or seven hours. So now I can walk you guys through a bit, little bit of like what the user experience is, uh, how we use this. So step one, you just need some way to put it in your wind, windshield so it can see where you're driving. Uh, which also means giving up a little bit of your ability to text and drive, but that's pretty frowned upon in California. So hopefully our developers will find ways that are so enticing that you'll want to do this. Step two, uh, this actually works uh, pretty intuitively with whatever integrated navigation features you have. If you want to use the AR navigation piece, you just type in where you're going and hit go, and then you're good to drive. So as you're driving, you can see a couple different layers of information that come up here. And that first one, you can see the speed limit shows up. Tap the screen again. You can see your AR navigation, the distance to the next vehicle, uh, potentially warnings about lane departures, traffic lights, segmentation layers, detections. There's a whole lot going on here. Uh, this is just some dash cam footage that we shot just a couple weeks ago uh, from this same segment we have running over there uh, continuously. Uh, what I can do now is sort of break down into the different layers. So the three big pieces are semantic segmentation, object detection, and AR navigation. 
So in this piece, this is something called semantic segmentation. Uh, I'm sure I have a lot of computer vision experts in the room, so I'll try to be pretty brief here. can go into more detail over there. But basically what we're doing is we're scanning this entire image and assigning every single pixel to a class. And right now we're running through, we're running about 10 or 11 different classes. Uh, class just means like how we would classify that. And we're able to do that at about 10 hertz. And we actually throttle it at 10 hertz uh, just to keep or performance high with other features you may be using at the same time, like if you want to listen to music or something, for example. So if you look at how this image is marked up, you can tell that sort of the driving surface is in green, but we're able to detect anywhere in the road that has a markup that indicates it's a little bit different. So you see the crosswalks kind of stand out here. You can see the sidewalk over there is always solid blue, knowing that's not really a safe place to drive. So if it's green means go. If it's not green, don't drive on it. Um, you can see yellow is shown up as lane markings and curbs. Uh, we have other vehicles show up in red. There's unfortunately no motorcycles in this video, but motorcycles have a separate markup. You can see traffic lights. Uh, the sky shows up as a color, buildings, vegetation, and then pedestrians when we see them also show up. So semantic segmentation is a pretty computationally expensive uh, process. But even running a very simple one, we can start to extract lane architecture, which is very helpful. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so on top of that, we also have the ability to do detection. So this is really exciting if, if for those of you that caught Microsoft's presentation yesterday about how they were able to start playing with this really in just like one day of having some of the metadata to be able to build something like this. Every single one of these bounding boxes is also attached to that, that pro point that I was just talking about. So we have X, Y, Z time. And because we know the properties of the camera that's in your car, if we know roughly where the car is and roughly where this bounding box shows up and what that bounding box is looking at, it's very easy for us to drop a point on the map for whatever we're looking for, whether that's other cars, whether it's pedestrians, traffic lights, construction vehicles, emergency vehicles, cones, curbs, any of those things. And that also allows us to learn much more about the environment than we could previously. And then the final piece is augmented reality navigation. Um, sort of uh, and try to break the fourth wall a little bit here. If, if anyone that's thinking carefully about how augmented reality works knows that essentially a, a naive version of augmented reality navigation is essentially just a coordinate transform API. So we know the nature of the world from the rest of the Mapbox ecosystem. We have this really nice 2D map. And then again, if we know the properties of the camera through which we're viewing the world, we can take those 2D features and drop them into three dimensions. And when we do that, that allows us to project the path that the vehicle needs to travel. But then when we add another layer on top of that to have lane architecture, for example, and be able to detect where the curbs are, we can also adapt how this AR navigation piece is adhering to the surface of the road. So when you see, the, um, when you see this green bar here sort of move around a little bit, it's trying to match that to lane markings. But if you've driven in San Francisco before, you know that lane markings are a nice to have, but definitely not required anywhere. So that's just a quick overview of some of the different layers of information that we're currently running on the Vision SDK today. I can talk very briefly about some of the key verticals that we see for having a lot of potential initially. Uh, so I think right out of the gate, I think professional driving applications are pretty interesting. So you can imagine as an Uber driver or a Lyft driver or a Grab or any kind of ride hailing service, it's really helpful. And one of the main frustrations is uh, when you're pulling to pick up your passenger and you look at the map, and because of multipath, you're not exactly sure where your car is, and you're also not exactly sure where your passenger is. Uh, but with the segmentation layer that we run, we can actually figure out not only that the driver of the car is on a specific road, but we can also tell you which lane you're in, which helps a lot. And then we can tell the passenger where the driver is expecting to find you. And if the passenger has a phone with the same app, you actually illuminate the spot on the sidewalk where your driver is expecting to find you, and the driver knows exactly where the passenger is expecting to meet the car. So that's, that's one cool thing you could do with it. Uh, obviously, fleets have a lot of applications here for either asset tracking or logistics. If you have a, a fleet of vans that have any kind of connected camera, you can start to collect more information for route optimization, turn restrictions, anything that you're interested in grabbing. If you're noticing that a road is going to close, you might want to change your delivery route for that afternoon. Uh, third piece is insurance. A lot of insurance companies today actually monitor driver performance just based on plugging the OBD2 port in your car. And all they can really go on is the signals that are readable off the CAN bus, which is pretty minimal. But once you add just a little bit of visual context, there's a lot more information that insurance companies can use to determine fair rates for people that they insure. And then finally, smart cities is another thing that's very exciting. Uh, any city that's interested in becoming one of the sort of early playgrounds for autonomous vehicle development or just for uh, 
improving the way that people are able to use mobility infrastructure, be that understand where new crosswalks need to be, pu be put in or where new bus routes should be put in. Uh, you can sort of think of slicing the Vision SDK also in one other way, which is between maintaining a map and utilizing a map. And you can do both at the same time, because as you're driving, you have access to everything that Mapbox already provides today in its ecosystem, and developers will be able to have sort of an expectation of what they're going to find and match that expectation of what they're seeing. And then you can flag any kind of inconsistencies. And if you, even if you have to build a higher resolution map that also utilizes sensors like LiDAR, you at least know that something is, is wildly different, and then you can get down to the millimeter level later. Um, that's just sort of a, a starter, but the, the really important takeaway here is I think that our developer community, a, as usual, is, is going to have all sorts of crazy ideas that are incredibly valuable uh, that we haven't even thought about yet. So with that, I actually I want to wrap on the formal presentation part and have us just walk 20 feet that way over to where the car is, and I would love to take any questions uh, that you guys have, and I will be there joined by the six engineers that actually worked on this, and we will answer questions until all the questions are answered. So thank you.